Hi everyone, my name is Nadine uh, and today I'll be delivering a lecture on glycemic control. Um, so uh, just uh, to preface, I'm going to be focusing more on inpatient um, management uh, of glycemic control um, and so we'll be going through the following topics. So how do we measure um, glycemic control, why is it important, um, inpatient hospital targets, um, what patient considerations we need to factor in. Um, we'll also discuss insulin and supplemental scales, um, oral hypoglycemic agents and their considerations for inpatients uh, and then we'll, we'll look at um, transitioning the patient from the hospital to the home. So firstly, how do we measure glycemic control? Um, and so a HbA1c essentially is, is one of the most widely used um, uh, measurements. Um, it's also called a, a glycated hemoglobin. Um, and just as a point of reference, a HbA1c, which is greater than or equal to 6.5%, um, is diagnostic of diabetes. Now we derive the HbA1c uh, from the fact that red blood cells are freely permeable to glucose. Um, glucose enters the cell and irreversibly attaches to hemoglobin, and that occurs at a rate which is dependent on the blood glucose concentration. Um, so uh, over a period of time, the higher the blood glucose concentration, um, the, the higher the HbA1c will be. Um, and it's used generally as an average um, of glycemic control over the past 8 to 12 weeks. Um, now, the importance of understanding this is um, that it helps us to understand the pitfalls of using a HbA1c. So um, we can get either falsely high or falsely low values. Falsely high values occur in states of slow red blood cell turnover. So for example, in chronic kidney disease, iron B12 or folate deficiency, uh, anemias, um, splenectomies are also patients who have abnormal hemoglobin types. Um, and falsely low values can occur in the opposite scenario. So if there's high red blood cell turnover, for example, patients treated for anemias um, listed above, um, those with hemolytic anemias or those with chronic kidney disease which are treated with um, erythropoietin. Um, I've also put there undetected hypoglycemia and that's really important to recognise in patients where um, they may be recording um, higher levels of um, BGLs during the day um, but you have a HbA1c level which is um, lower than expected so um, in patients like that it's really important to um, exclude overnight hypoglycemic events um, which they aren't recording um, and it's also important to have a look at their glucometer and make sure that it's functioning correctly. So why is glycemic control important? Well, in the inpatient setting uh, in particular, uh, unwell patients, both those with or without diabetes, are more prone to hyperglycemia. Um, so that's um, due in part to the fact that stress hormones are catabolic. Um, so for example, adrenaline, glucagon and cortisol. Um, and they will promote hyperglycemia. Um, and then unwell patients are also more likely to be more insulin resistant. So um, around 80% of critically unwell patients will be more insulin resistant. So not only are, uh, are there factors that are promoting hyperglycemia, but they're also less likely to respond to, to insulin as well. So they kind of work against each other. Um, and then finally, there are common inpatient treatments which cause hyperglycemia. So for example, the use of high-dose corticosteroids, octreotide, uh, and nasogastric feeds or TPN, which are often delivered um, at supra physiological um, times or, or, or 24-hour feeds, for example, or 16-hour feeds, um, that, can, um, that can impact on a patient's blood glucose levels. Um, so why is glycemic control important? Um, again, so we we have to think about complications of hypoglycemia. So some of the short-term complications, intermediate and long-term complications. Some of the short-term would be metabolic um, uh, consequences like DKA or hyperosmolar um, hypoglycemic syndrome. And so um, particularly in patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, respectively, um, it's important to avoid hypoglycemia, to avoid um, those emergencies. Um, also, uh, the... A patient who's consistently hyperglycemia is more prone to infections, um, sepsis, poor wound healing, um, and so it's important to consider that. And also cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, um, both in the short and long term. Um, um, other things that need to be uh, considered and of why glycemic control is important. Firstly, um, there are worse outcomes if a patient is um, persistently hyperglycemic. So for example, um, trauma patients who are hypoglycemic have a higher mortality rate, longer ICU stays, as well as having a greater incidence of nosocomial infections. Um, there are also better outcomes um, with improved glycemic control. So on the flip side, critically unwell, both medical and surgical patients who remain within the desired glycemic range 
um, for 80% of their admission have better outcomes than those who do not. So um, there's evidence for um, for controlling the hypoglycemia um, and, and having better outcomes um, for patients. Um, and lastly, prevention. Um, by controlling um, a patient's blood glucose levels, um, we can prevent long-term um, microvascular complications such as retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. Um, and there's also a correlation long-term between higher rates of hypoglycemia and cardiovascular disease. Um, however, it's important to note that there's mixed evidence to suggest that intensive glycemic control um, may actually be harmful in patients who have had long-standing diabetes, so that's greater than eight years. Um, and um, I have some studies listed below that, um, that allude to that. Um, so essentially there is a correlation, um, but, um, but not uh, strong evidence for very tight control. So what targets do we aim for in the hospital? So we generally aim for blood glucose levels between 5 to 10 millimoles. Uh, and frequency of blood glucose monitoring will depend on the patient, but most commonly it will be before meals, two hours post meals at 10 p.m. and at 2 a.m. Um, if the patient's on an insulin dextrose infusion, that'll be hourly. Uh, and if the patient is fasting, uh, Q6 hourly um, BGLs. But again, it will depend on the patient and, and the situation. Uh, the next thing I want to discuss is um, the importance of considering your patient uh, in determining um, how to manage their BGLs. So uh, the first example I have is a diet controlled type 2 diabetic who presents to the hospital with a non-critical illness. Um, so the first thing um, we need to do is monitor blood glucose levels. It's always important to have um, as many data points as possible um, so that you can um, map out uh, the, the, how the patient was responding to the to the um, treatment plan um, and also to help um, in titrations. Um, and then you want to look at a HbA1c, so either a new one or, or chase one that's been done recently in an outpatient. Um, and the reason why is um, it's important to confirm that the patient is actually uh, controlling their diabetes well with diet alone. So sometimes patients will be um, not on any medication, but when you do a HbA1c, um, sometimes it might be worth starting them on something. Um, in general, if they are truly diet controlled, they don't require any specific therapy, um, but you can commence um, them on medications if they have persistently elevated BGLs. Uh, the second scenario is a type 2 diabetic um, on medications prior to the admission. Um, so again, um, similarly to the, the last case, you want to monitor their blood glucose levels, um, check the HbA1c, and if it indicates reasonable control, um, so that's a HbA1c less than 8% generally, um, you can consider their med uh, you, sorry, you can continue their medications, um, but you just need to consider um, why the patient's in hospital. So if the patient's uh, meal by mouth, for example, in a theatre, uh, you'd want to cease their oral agents um, and emit their short-acting insulins. Um, and similarly, if they've got a reduced appetite or an AKI, uh, you want to consider reducing um, the dosages of, them, of their medications or if it's appropriate just to stop them altogether and monitor the patient until they're well enough to be uh, placed back on those medications. Uh, and the next scenario is a type 1 diabetic, um, so again, monitor blood glucose levels and do a HbA1c to see uh, that patient's level of control previously. Um, the important thing to remember is these patients have an absolute requirement for insulin. So um, I've used the example here of the patient goes to theatre um, because that's often where these patients um, can run into trouble. Um, but if the patient is going to theatre, um, it is very important to give them their long-acting insulin the day before um, and measure their blood glucose levels two hourly. Um, you can, it's very reasonable to withhold their short-acting insulin while the patient's fasting um, and monitoring their BGLs. If they, if they start to drop below 10, you can commence uh, on IV dextrose or um, greater than 10, um, you can give them some short-acting insulin PRN. Um, also, uh, I've used the, the, the numbers of 10, um, less than or greater than 10, um, because that's based on uh, up to date. But of course, at this point, you would be getting the endocrine team um, at the hospital involved to have a look at the patient. Uh, and the last thing to consider um, for targets for glycemic control is um, to think about patients who may have a different goal. So in general, you would be aiming for um, a HbA1c of less than or equal to 7%, um, but you may be uh, accepting of more relaxed glycemic um, control in patients who have a limited life expectancy, uh, patients who have recurrent and severe hypoglycemic events, um, patients with hypoglycemic um, unawareness, so essentially the, that's the, a cohort of patients that don't have symptoms to um, alert them that they're having a hypo, 
um, which can be quite dangerous, um, and also patients who have had diabetes for a long uh, duration and have had clinical cardiovascular disease. So that's a patient who's, um, like I mentioned before, had had diabetes for many years and has had a heart attack, for example. Um, we don't want to aim for very tight control on those patients because it can actually be detrimental. Um, so who do we want to aim for uh, tighter controlling? So um, anyone who's planning pregnancy or pregnant uh, currently, the target for HbA1c is less than or equal to 6%. Um, and those with a short duration of newly diagnosed diabetes. Um, so um, I'll touch on this in the next slide, but essentially we'll be aiming for um, a HbA1c of less than 6.5% within the first six months of diagnosis. Um, and essentially anyone else who can achieve um, good glycemic control um, without having significant hypos or side effects. Uh, so like I said, um, so this is the uh, United Kingdom perspective prospective diabetes study, um, which was a landmark study, um, and it um, was it involved 3,867 patients who had a new diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, um, and these patients were randomized to an intensive uh, or a conventional therapy group with diet. Um, at the five-year mark, the intensive group um, had a significant reduction in their microvascular complications, but there was no difference in mortality. Um, importantly, at the 10-year follow-up, even when the HbA1c worsened in the intensive, uh, intensively treated group, um, they still had a significant reduction in the microvascular complications, myocardial infarction, and death from all cause. Um, so this has been referred to as the legacy effect, and this is um, why in the previous slide, um, the recommendation for a newly diagnosed diabetic um, is to actually have quite tight control. Um, however, it's important to note that um, I've just put in two other studies at the bottom, which I won't discuss, but the Accord and Advanced studies um, do have different results to this study, but they did use a different cohort of patients, namely patients who had had diabetes for a longer period of time, um, and they were aiming for tighter uh, control in those, patient, in those patients. So um, it's just important to, um, to realize that there is a difference in, um, in our goals um, depending on how long the patient has had diabetes. So the next thing is insulin therapy. So most type 2 diabetic patients will require some sort of insulin therapy, even if it's just temporary, uh, during inpatient admissions. Um, and commonly um, what will be used is a basal bolus regimen. So not always, but, um, but in general, 50% of the long-acting will be um, uh, sorry, 50% of the total daily insulin requirement will be long-acting, so for example, a lantus at night, uh, and then the other 50% will be a short-acting, which will be divided over the three distinct meal times. So, for example, a patient requiring 60 units of insulin per day, 30 units will be a basal, uh, sorry, a basal and um, 30 units will be um, a bolus, so that will be 10 units per meal. Um, now, um, this will obviously change depending on the patient situation. So if the patient is on regular feeds, um, for example, then they will have regular ins insulin dosing during those feeds, either Q6 hourly or Q4 hourly, um, and it will really depend on the patient's response and their, um, their glycemic control. Uh, and if the patient is receiving high-dose corticosteroids, um, then the insulin will be given, um, uh, an insulin such as protophane um, will be given, which matches the peak and trough um, of the corticosteroids. So it, it helps to better cover that patient um, over that period of time. Again, however, this will depend on the patient um, and each, in, each case will be um, considered separately. Um, following on from that um, is supplemental scales. So um, I've just put a note here that supplemental scales are not the same as a sliding scale. So a supplemental scale essentially is a correction of short-acting insulin, which is used at mealtimes um, to supplement the regular mealtime bolus insulin. Um, a traditional sliding scale actually has no change to the basal insulin, um, and a short-acting insulin is actually given based on the pre-meal or bedtime blood glucose level. So a traditional sliding scale is generally more of a reactive approach, um, and it's generally not something that's used um, uh, or recommended now, um, whereas a supplemental scale um, is more so just used, um, as the word suggests, on top of um, the, bo the regular bolus insulin that the patient will um, get. And it's generally, um, it's generally helpful to have a look at the trends of the supplemental insulin that the patient is requiring. So um, if a patient is re consistently requiring an extra two units of insulin at lunchtime, for example, um, then um, you could uh, increase their lunchtime insulin uh, by two units and then continue to monitor. Um, so that's when it can be quite helpful. Um, it's also important to recognize that 
although that there's a recommended supplemental scale that will uh, generally come with um, a medication chart or on, on um, e-meds now, um, it actually can be adjusted uh, based on the patient's insulin sensitivity. So um, the insulin sensitivity is actually how much the blood glucose level will be lowered by a single unit of insulin. Um, and it's generally calculated by dividing um, 100 by the total daily amount of insulin required. So um, as an example, um, if a patient requires a total of 50 units in a, in a day um, of insulin, their insulin sensitivity factor will be 100 divided by 50, which will give you 2. So one unit of insulin will decrease the blood glucose level by 2 millimoles per litre. Um, and this can be useful because some patients will be more or less sensitive to insulin. So as a general trend, but, but of course not a complete rule, um, patients with type 1 diabetes have, a, have lower insulin requirements than those with type 2 diabetes. Um, and that's generally because type 2 diabetics um, tend to be more insulin resistant. Um, so um, by modifying the supplemental scale, um, you can um, ensure that the patient um, is safe and is at a lower risk of having a hypo um, if you can adjust it. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to discuss is common oral, high oral uh, hypoglycemic agents and their precautions. So um, the first one is metformin, which is um, obviously quite a um, important one. Um, and um, we want to uh, either dose adjust if the patient has renal impairments or a creatinine clearance of less than 90, um, or cease it altogether if the creatinine clearance is less than 30. Um, the same goes for hepatic impairment. Generally, it would just be deceased if it's quite severe hepatic impairment. Um, if the patient's due for surgery, you can cease it the day of, so they can generally have it the day before. Um, and any other condition which causes tissue hypoxia and acidosis, so for example, a myocardial infarct um, or PE or severe heart failure, um, you would want to cease the metformin just to avoid the risk of lactic acidosis. Um, it's also important to um, remember that if a patient's receiving IV contrast for a scan, to cease the metformin 48 hours after um, in order to reduce the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy. Uh, the next group of uh, medications is sulfonylureas, so things like glicoside. Um, so uh, patients can have uh, can have dose-adjusted um, uh, doses um, if they have renal impairment um, or sometimes it can be ceased altogether. Uh, hepatic impairment uh, and pregnancy, um, uh, the recommendation is to stop. Um, and if the patient is going for surgery, again like metformin, it would be to cease the day of surgery. Um, and if the patient has any other acute illness or ketoacidosis, um, of course you'd stop it as well. Uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, so that's things like citagliptin and linagliptin. Um, again, um, you have to look at the patient's renal function. You would dose reduce um, the citagliptin if the EGFR is less than 45. Uh, or alternatively, alternatively, what I've seen done is just to change the patient over to linagliptin, which doesn't actually require any um, dose adjustment for, for renal impairment. Um, uh, also, um, you would cease the day of surgery. Uh, and in pregnancy and breastfeeding, there isn't any evidence for safety, so you would just um, stop them. Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. So um, again, um, it's very important to stop these if the creatinine clearance is less than 45. Um, and unlike the others, which you would cease the day of surgery, it's really important to stop the SGLT2 inhibitor three days prior uh, and to only restart it when the patient is eating and drinking normally. So if the patient's had a big operation and they're not tolerating um, uh, much oral intake or they're only on a small amount of clear fluids, for example, um, it's probably best to wait until they're eating and drinking a proper diet until you restart something like an SGLT2. Um, and that's to uh, reduce the risk of a euglycemic ketoacidosis. Um, Similarly, if the patient has an acute illness, um, bowel prep, prolonged fasting, low carbohydrate intake um, or excessive alcohol intake, hopefully not in the hospital, um, but um, you would also cease it to avoid um, the risk of ketoacidosis. Um, again, um, pregnancy and breastfeeding, there isn't any evidence for safety, so you would not put a patient on, on this medication. Um, and in the elderly, it's also very important um, to be wary of starting them on this in the hospital. Um, firstly, because um, of the risk of hypotension, because they lose a lot of fluid, they become quite dehydrated, and they can have um, significant postural drops and are more prone to falling. Um, and it's also important to counsel um, elderly patients on how to use the SGLT2 inhibitor. So um, it's important that they know that if they are acutely unwell um, or if they're fasting um, or if they're going to go to theatre, that they know 
uh, to stop the SGLT2 and that they know which medication it is. So for example, if it's a Webster pack, they need to know which medication it is so that they can stop that medication um, so that they don't run into any trouble um, later on down the track. And if, if you're not confident that they can do that or that their caregiver can, can do that, um, then it might not be a good option to put them on it. Um, and the other thing to counsel patient patients on is the frequency of um, UTIs. So um, it, it can um, predispose patients to UTIs and if a patient already has frequent UTIs, it might be something just to um, consider. So the last thing that I wanted to touch on is how to transition the patient from the hospital back home. Um, so um, if glycemic control was acceptable um, pre-admission, um, then in general, the patient's previous regimen can be reinstated. Um, but it's important um, that the patient is, is of course, followed up closely um, and that um, particularly if they're started on um, something like insulin, um, that um, the the first instance is to, to start them on insulin at least one day prior to discharge, um, and that's to allow um, a diabetic nurse educator to review the patient. Um, it's to allow you to discuss the regimen with the patient, the family, and caregivers, both written and orally, uh, and to confirm that they can they understand um, what to do. They know how to troubleshoot, for example, if the patient is hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic. Um, and it's also to confirm the ability both of the patient to actually inject the insulin safety uh, safely um, and that um, if they're not injecting it that the person who will be injecting it is present and is able to demonstrate their safety in, in administering the medication. So um, that's really important um, just to, to, um, to make sure that the patient just isn't sent home with insulin that they're not sure how to use. Um, if the patient still drives and has a license, then um, it's important to advise them that they have to have a blood glucose level of greater than five before they drive. Um, and if the patient's had a significant hypoglycemic episode in hospital or really any other reason um, which would lead you to believe that the patient should not be driving or might not be safe to drive, um, for example, recurrent presentations with HHS, for example, um, then the patient has to be cleared to, to drive by an endocrinologist. So, um, so you would refer them to, to the endocrinologist and then um, tell them to uh, keep a log of their blood glucose levels um, and then the endocrinologist will have to sign off um, to say that they're safe to go back on the road. Um, and like I was alluding to before, um, arrange follow-up with a GP, a diabetes clinic, uh, or with an endocrinologist, um, because um, obviously diabetes is a, a chronic condition, um, and um, often patients' um, uh, medication regimens uh, will change um, during the course of their disease, so um, it's important that they follow up with someone um, who can monitor that for them. Um, so that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you gained something from the lecture, and... Um, yeah, thank you.